Welcome to The Right Mindset. Have you ever wondered how your favorite books transform from good to great before they hit the shelves? Well, <laughs> today's lesson is going to be all about the fourth draft. This is a master class, a master class, all summed up into a very short video uh, where we revise uh, with beta reader feedback. So, you know, but why is that important, Thomas? It's a good question. The fourth draft is a critical phase where external feedback comes into play, helping to polish your manuscript by highlighting strengths and identifying the weaknesses. Now, what is the fourth draft overall, though? Why, why this draft? You know, why, why not a, a, a one and done, two and done, maybe seven and done, right? Well, the fourth draft is a version of your manuscript that incorporates specifically the beta reader uh, feedback. It's an opportunity to address issues that weren't evident to you, but were caught by fresh eyes. And remember, the beta reader experience, uh, the beta reader is the experience of the novel and not necessarily the um, foundation or mechanics of the manuscript. So before we go into uh, the walkthrough, I'm going to give you, I'm going to show you feedback. I'm going to show you uh, uh, ways to kind of look, look at that. And um, what else do I got for you? Uh, how to look deeper into the feedback. We're going to go into that. And then, of course, uh, uh, yeah, there you go. All right. So uh, I like to do some tips and trips, <laughs> tips and tricks before we get into it. So number one, you know, uh, the short of it when it comes to organize uh, the feedback, you know, you want to compile and categorize other feedback from your beta readers by themes such as plot, character development, pacing, and style to streamline the revision process. All right. Use tools like spreadsheets or dedicated software to keep feedback organized and easily acceptable. Now, what is the long of it? The long of it is, you know, there's a systematic approach to everything, right? So begin by gathering all feedback and sorting it into thematic categories such as plot inconsistencies, uh, character development, where and when it's lacking, and of course, pacing and stylistics, et cetera, et cetera. Sort of like what we said in the short of it. But you might even find that the feedback creates areas that categorize itself that you weren't specifically thinking about. Uh, and this method of organizing will help streamline um, and uh, make it cohesive when it goes into looking at the information and putting it into practice. All right. And of course, tools of the trade when it comes to organizing stuff, uh, whatever works for you. You know, there's Google Docs, there's Excel, there's Scrivener. There's all these different kind of programs that exist in the world. Uh, whatever works for you is the right uh, program for you. So I'm not going to support or uh, deny any one program. I personally use Google Google uh, Sheets, Google Docs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but uh, I only do that for convenience because if I'm out and about and an idea pops up, I can just open it up. But that doesn't make it better or worse than anything else. Number two, identifying common issues. The short of it, you want to focus on reoccurring feedback. If multiple readers point out the same or similar issues, these are areas that likely need your attention and become priority. Uh, and that's why you should prioritize common issues as they represent the most noticeable disruptions to the reader's experience. But the long of it, pay special attention to feedback that reoccurs across multiple beta readers. Reoccurring issues are indeed red flags indicating parts of the manuscript that are not working well and are likely to be problematic. All right. Uh, if somebody's like, uh, you know, this character just feels weird. I, I, you know, they just, uh, to me, they're not working out and that's the only, and out of 10 readers, that's the only person. And you, you, you still got to listen to that. You still got to put it on the sheet. But that might be the last thing to even look at. And it might end up needing no work. It's just something you should look at. Um, and over, overall, you want to always prioritize and address the common issues as they uh, generally represent critical flaws in the manuscript. They're the things that are standing out for you. So prior, prioritize helping uh, uh, to organize your time ultimately and uh, get in there and manage those revisions by focusing on changes that will have the most significant impact. Thrace. Uno, dos, tres. The short of it, 
refine your writing style, address specific comments on prose, dialogue, and pacing. Look for suggestions that make your writing clearer and more engaging without compromising your style. Hey, you want to experiment with different ways to implement these suggestions to see which ones best enhance your narrative. Remember, overall, your writer's voice is your writer's voice, but that doesn't mean what you write is bad if it just needs clarification. You might have the best words, the best choices, but you're not allowing it to be filtered through characters. There's no plot, character development, or world building within it. It's just descriptive for descriptive sake. Uh, it doesn't even add to the mood or the atmosphere to enhance the scene. And in those situations, it doesn't mean you're a bad writer. You're writing excellent. Your, your, your prose are great in the, in the style of your word choice. They're just not doing anything. And that's okay, too. Sometimes uh, you got to change things up. And that's part of the process because great writing is rewriting. The long of it. You know, when you get uh, specific feedback on uh, prose or dialogue or even pacing, uh, you know, you want to refine these areas and uh, it can dramatically improve uh, the readability and engagement of your manuscript. Sometimes things aren't clear. Sometimes we as writers feel because we know the story, we know the characters, we're inside the page that sometimes he said, she said, or, you know, Raven said, or, you know, whoever said, sometimes we don't realize that uh, we haven't clarified that. Um, a note that I give to a lot of my clients is think of dialogue as top down, explain in the top and then play with it going down, you know, and if you could clarify at the top, then it gives you a little bit more free reign to explore and discover the conversation through as you go down to the bottom. But if it's not clear in the top, it makes the rest of it a little difficult. Um, the other thing is like sometimes we get a little uh, carried away with prose, you know, we don't realize that we're we should be breaking that prose up. We think that it's a long we're not understanding as writers that there's a certain beats to a moment or a POV change or, or an action change or the movement change. And sometimes breaking up a long pro uh, will help with pacing, but it'll also help with clarification. Okay. So you keep those in mind. And obviously, you know, trying out new things, different ways to incorporate suggestions, uh, will help you figure out what works best for you. You know, sometimes we might think what we're writing makes clear, it's clear, and then we hear some feedback and it's it's a common thing that's coming back. We're like, all right, maybe I should look at this. And then you rework and you realize, okay, great writing is rewriting. So, but sometimes it's just small tweaks, you know, in a sentence structure or, you know, dialogue or whatever that significantly enhances it because sometimes it's all about being simplified, you know? And of course, number four, uh, keep your voice. You know, the short of it is, while it's important to consider feedback critically, ensure the revisions don't strip away your unique voice and style. Balance feedback with your creative instincts. Feedback is invaluable, but it should not override your vision for the, for the story. Now, the long of it is, you know, you have to weigh the beta reader's uh, suggestions and by suggestions, I mean feedback. Remember, if anyone suggests a change, probably not as valuable as their feedback on their experience. If somebody says you should do X, Y, and Z, I think this character should fall in love with that character. Uh, that is probably terrible advice. <laughs> uh, but if they say I, I don't feel these char I don't feel the chemistry between these characters, that's different because they're they're giving you feedback on their experience of it. Uh, so. The thing, though, is sometimes uh, feedback can come off and uh, maybe you start changing things, which then will change your voice. So at, at the end of the day, feedback, uh, it may be invaluable, but uh, it should be more of a guide and not necessarily dictate your revisions. And this will help ensure that changes enhance the story without diluting your unique voice. You have the final say. You are the writer. Just because people aren't experiencing in a certain way doesn't mean it's bad. Again, remember, every uh, you know, experience is opinion. Uh, the things I would look for, though, is clarity. The things I would look for is are people, you know, getting things that are coming. If they're not seeing the things coming, especially after reading the whole book, and you're like, oh, I really wish these reveals would have popped. That just means go back and kind of like put a little bit more work into the seating. You want it to pay off. You know, you want them to have a good experience with the book. And uh, those kind of feedbacks are really important. You know, if they're not seeing uh, 
the work you're trying to do, that's when you're like, all right, maybe I got to put a little bit of a little elbow grease into that and kind of work on it. Um, but ultimately, you know, your voice is a significant part of the writing process and a part of the experience for your readers. And that's mostly why they come to you because they know what they're going to get. They know what kind of style of writing and they like it. They like they're coming back because they like what you're doing. Uh, they like the way the things you talk about. They like the way you see things, your lens of perspective. So, again, while feedback uh, is important, you know, refining your style based on feedback is something you should be wary about just in case it changes uh, that might adjust your original voice. So you have the final say. OK. All right. Before we go into the walkthrough, uh, if, you if you haven't already, please subscribe and hit the bell icon so you don't miss out. <laughs> it's time for the walkthrough. Yeah. The first thing we're going to do is talk about uh, feedback. Feedback notes. Um, all right. So let's look at some examples, shall we? Shall we? <laughs> Shall we? All right, let's see. Let's share the window. Let's share the window. All right, there you go. Hey, look at that. All right. Hey, hey. Okay. So here's a uh, here's a uh, four. No, oh, one second. Okay, yeah. Here's four beta readers. Okay. So let's let's read through the beta reader notes. Okay, and what we're gonna do is we're going to look at the feedback. Then we're going to look deeper into the feedback and we're going to go through some of the notes we talked about. We're going to organize the feedback uh, and then we're going to identify some common issues. All right. And then, uh, and then, uh, you know, and we'll, we'll take it from there. All right. So the first step is uh, let's, let's read through it. Okay. So number one, uh, this person is like, uh, what is this? One second, one second, one second. One second. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. I numbered it so it was easy to understand. Okay. All right. So, uh, because uh, the next step, you know, we want to be able to make sense of it. All right. So, number one, the pacing, all right. Beta Reader One says the pacing in the middle of the book feels slow. The story gets bogged down in un unnecessary details. Uh, now, again, pacing is just the speed at which information is provided to the reader or the speed at which information unfolds to the reader, right? Uh, so sometimes if um, unnecessary details might be that you're going too deep into description or too deep into wor uh, world building or too, dip too deep into exposition. All right. The second one is, uh, I found the main character's decisions in chapter 10 to be out of character and confusing. Now, this would probably happen because uh, you established them a certain way in the first nine chapters. Let's say they're more, uh, they stand up for their convictions. And then in chapter 10, uh, somebody goes, well, we should do this. And they go, all right, let's do it. And then it turns out what they agreed to in that chapter is something they wouldn't necessarily agree to. And that would be a clear uh, example of a character not standing by their uh, um, positions, the things they believe in. All right, Beta Reader 2, they give us three notes. All right, the dialogue is in some scenes feels unnatural and stilted. Uh, this could just be because um, it's written with perfect grammar, which doesn't necessarily mean that it is unnatural. Some people do speak, uh, they, they are very good at articulating their thoughts, utilizing the English lexicon to... Uh, uh, navigate dexterously through uh, convoluted conversations to manipulate. Anyway. <laughs> uh, but uh, dialogue can feel unnatural and stilted. And uh, this is easy to do when you just kind of break it up. You know, if there's a chunk of dialogue, you might be like, well, how do I create a discussion around this? How do I let this information come out naturally? Uh, you know, movement, stuff like that. You want to add movement to the dialogue. You don't want it to just be informational. Uh, the f number four, uh, the relationship between the two main characters is not well developed. Their interactions feel superficial. All right. 
Uh, this is a great. This is a great little bit of uh, feedback. It might just come down to these characters are just doing things that are expected of, say, uh, uh, a main character male and a main character female. Uh, you know, the man and the woman are just doing things that uh, are stereotypically man and woman, and you know, they're just there to play their role, and that's not interesting. <laughs> Number five, the ending feels rushed. <clears throat> I think you need to spend more time resolving the conflicts. And tying up loose ends. Now, this almost falls into subjective feedback, <coughs> but I'll accept it as objective feedback because uh, the ending feels rush is really the feedback. We don't necessarily have to take into account. I think you need to spend more time resolving the conflicts and tying up loose ends, right? There, readers shouldn't give you the solution. But the ending feels rushed. That's the thing you should be looking at. Why does it feel rushed? Uh, their idea to make it work is not really the solution. That's their story they're trying to write. It's your job to go and do the work, right? Because once you're done writing, the work actually begins. This is the rewriting. This is the evaluation. This is organizing, et cetera, et cetera. Let's look at beta reader number three. They also have three notes. I noticed several grammatical uh, errors and typos throughout the manuscript. A thorough proofreading is necessary. No crap. Uh, <laughs> I put this in there because we all hate this one. Uh, 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 listen, the third draft, which is the draft that the beta readers have read, is not the final draft, which is where you would hire a proofreader or a line editor. So when you get this, uh, I usually, when I send stuff to alpha readers and beta readers, I, uh, I'll i give them a couple notes. I go, while reading this, uh, keep in mind that any grammatical errors or, um, you know, spelling errors, stuff like that is unimportant. These are still working drafts. Uh, all the cleanup happens at the end. So please do not worry about notating that. Um, however, some people uh, forget to read that. And uh, you get this. This is this is a note that I would just bypass completely. <laughs> but as an example, it's there. Number seven, the plot twist in chapter 15 feels contrived and uh, con unconvincing. It needs to be foreshadowed better early in the story. This is another example of subjective and objective. The objective is the plot twist in chapter 15 feels contrived and unconvincing. That is their feeling on the experience, but it becomes objective because it is general. The subjective, their personal thoughts on how to fix it, is to foreshadow better early in the story. I'd probably uh, ignore that. But I would pay attention to the front half. I would go, all right, if it feels un uh, contrived and unconvincing, I do need to earn that. So I should be seeding stuff earlier. Maybe it's less about force. Maybe I don't want to foreshadow. Maybe I want to just place the seeds there. I want the foundation to be earned. Foreshadowing is like nudging the reader uh, in a way that allows them to go, oh, they mention X, Y, and Z. Uh, you know, maybe it was like dialogue where it goes, uh, the worst thing that could happen is that the place collapses in on us. That's a form of foreshadowing. Uh, however, <clears throat> showing that construction has stopped or, um, you know, uh, things like that, like little, little things like that to show that the, the foundation of the, the cavern is going to collapse, um, that's seeding. You're seeding that that is a possibility. Uh, I know it sounds like it could be foreshadowing, but seeding earns the result foreshadowing leads people to come to ideas foreshadowing can in turn become a red herring uh but seeding is something that is factual it's 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 <clears throat> it uh adds to the validity of what is revealed okay uh seeding also affects like character if you see if you say a character is brave and you don't do anything to show that they're brave until one chapter where they are brave it doesn't get earned. So you have to seed them being brave, show little moments of them being brave. Brave Bravery doesn't always have to be to fight things, but bravery you know, is whatever you want it to be for that character. So you seed that by showing small examples of it. It's better to show than tell. Uh, you don't necessarily have to point it out with characters where somebody does something and they're like, wow, that was brave. Like You don't have to do that. But you do have to show them 
being something or um or smaller examples of them being something and that's seeding that's the difference we see seeding and foreshadowing eight the secondary characters are one dimensional and lack depth that's a very that's a very subjective uh 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 feedback they need more development to make them feel like real people that's also subjective uh however if somebody says the secondary characters are one dimensional and lack depth and that's how they feel uh that is something you should look into uh you should be like well let me just pay attention to characters what what are they missing do, do they have flaws not that all characters need to have flaws do they have pure, are their motivations pure uh clarified and 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 uh in forefront uh do they have clear positions um do they have more than one desire than uh i want to collect all the diet cherry pepsi in the world like <laughs> is there more going on right and then finally uh, the fourth beta reader the world building is inconsistent there are contradictions in the descriptions of the setting and the rules of the fictional world that's a great note especially if you start talking about dragons and it turns out there aren't dragons, but then like people are like, I saw dragons and then we never see dragons in the book. And then they're like, dragons are fantasy. And like, you know, and then there's like books and books and books on dragons and how they are real. Like that would be a crazy world. Doing. Anyway. <clears throat> all right. Time for the next thing. Looking deeper into the feedback. All right. We want to organize the feedback. I'm going to bring this down into another sheet. Just so we get the whole thing. Boop. All right. I'm going to take away looking deeper. First thing we want to do is we want to organize the feedback. Okay. So some of the things we're looking for. I would do this and I would do that. We want pacing. Uh, character development would be another one. Dialogue. Plot. Uh, world building. I think world building is like this. I don't know. There's two versions of it. one is a noun, one is a, anyway, not a noun. A uh, uh, like one is the act of, uh, and mechanics. Okay. Beep, beep. All right. So let's see if we go back. All right. The pacing, well, this is definitely pacing, so I don't even have to read the whole thing because it starts with the word pacing. Okay. Pacing! All right, and then uh, let's see. Oh, the ending feels rushed. All right. And then let's go back and just take another look. I noticed several grammar. The plot twist is uh, no. The second character, no. World building. All right. So that's not pacing. All right. <clears throat> What's next? Character development. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. I'm still sick. Actually, I'll probably be sick for the rest of my life. But all right. Um, okay. So uh, let's see. I found the main. Oh, okay. Main character. This is definitely character development because it has to do with character. Boop. Let's go back up. The oh wait, wait. Uh, so these two have been used. So we we can we can do that. What else was? Oh, the ending feels rushed. Was used. Right. <clears throat> the dialogue seems no. The relationships relationships is character development. I noticed several grammar. Who are you? What do you mean you noticed several? All right. The plot twist. No. Secondary characters. This is. And before I go, I'll just read the last one. The fictional. This is a uh, world building. So it has nothing to do with character. All right. There we go. <clears throat> dialogue. What do you think? Is there any dialogue? Let's go. Let's see. The dialogue. Ha. Huh, Keyword. This is definitely going to go down here. And then we kind of saw everything else, but uh, oh wait, it's just so we know that's cleared up. Several grammar. That's not necessarily dialogue. That's gonna be. That's probably gonna be more like mechanics, right? So dialogue is specifically dialogue. This is just typos and grammatic errors. Plot twist. Um, I would. I would say that has to do with plot, and this is. So there's no dialogue. All right. Oh, plot. 
the plot has unfolded. All right, so we know that this one is the plot because we just read it. Bring that down. There's another step to this. Just bear with me. Uh, All right, number nine is the world building because that's next, right? World building. And, of course, mechanics. Number six. Number six. All right. So <clears throat> the next step is identifying common issues. Well, if we look at this, you know, the big thing is uh, it looks like character development. <clears throat> All right. We saw two, four, and eight. All right. Pacing has two. Character has three. Dialogue has one. Pace has one. Uh, they all have one. So... Right now, character development is the main common denominator. Uh, you know, this is for both main and secondary characters. And uh, these also came from separate uh, separate readers, right? So if we go back, two, four, and eight. So that came from three separate readers. So this would turn into priority. All right, so we know that that is priority. Uh, if we look at pacing, um, oh, pacing. Oh no, that's right. I got pacing. Yeah, okay. Pacing, pacing. Again, pacing came from, let's see, one and five. So that's two different readers. All right. So pacing turns out it's going to be also the second priority. And uh, even, you know, even though it was only two readers, you know, pacing is off. So we have to look at the middle. Uh, this, uh, you know, what could it be? So we have to pay attention to these. These five uh, elements are very important. Um. One, two. Da, 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 da. All right. And let's see. Looking, looking, looking. Plot and world. So plot and world. Uh, you know. And these aren't really that common. Uh, they're more like suggestions, right? Uh, you know, plot was only an issue to one reader. And world building was an issue for another reader. So these these I would still look at, right? Because no feedback is technically bad feedback um, unless it's ignored. So again, no feedback is bad feedback unless it's ignored. So it's still good to kind of look at these things. But because only one reader uh, identified it, it might not be a main issue. So you leave it last, you know. Oh, I had to take a drink. All right. <clears throat> so what's next? Refine your writing style. So now basically, if you revise the dialogue, uh, you know, in the identified scene, whatever it is, this is where you would put the real work into it and kind of adjust it and stuff like that. So if we looked at this, the dialogue uh, in some scenes feels unnatural. Now, you know, you might you might write dialogue. I should come into the picture. You might write dialogue where it's, <clears throat> hey, Jack, we need to go uh, to the store and we have to get bread. And and uh, Jack goes, but uh, Tim, I have plenty of bread at my house, so I'm just going to go home and uh, make a sandwich. <laughs> Very unnatural, right? But if you go, all right, well, what is the conversation about, you know? And he's like, you know, not many people always say the names. Names names are for emphasis, you know? Like, you want to use the name for, you want to use their names to get their attention or you want to emphasize something. But if it's always like, yo, Jack, what's up? No, Jim, how you doing? Ah, Jack, you know, it's all right. Like, that's bad, right? But in that moment where it's like, we want to get the bread, we got to go to the store to get the bread, you go, you go, what is it, almost 3 o'clock? Yeah, uh, my stomach's killing me. I think I'm getting hungry. Me too, man. What do you want? What do you want? I don't know. Maybe sandwiches. 
oh, sandwiches would be so good. You know, oh, I could totally go for uh, provolone with some ham and turkey. Oh, yeah, that actually sounds good. But uh, what, what about like uh, roast beef? You know, maybe a little roast beef with mozzarella cheese. Now they're having a conversation. And their characters coming out. They have like their specific likes. Positions are being discovered. What the position is, the kind of sandwiches they want. Right. And then you can get to that moment where it's like, oh, well, let's see if we have any. Oh, I don't have any bread or anything. We got to go to the store. I don't want to go to the store. I I live two houses down and I got plenty of bread. Why don't we just go there and, and make the sandwiches? Uh, well, because I, I also don't have the uh, the provolone that I want. I want to get provolone. Well, I, I definitely have my roast beef and mozzarella I, and onions. I got some onions. I think I'm going to just go home. Why don't you go to the store, get your food, meet me back at my house, or I'll meet you back here. And there you go. <clears throat> now the dialogue is natural. And it isn't just like, I, I am hungry. I would like a sandwich. <laughs> so you have to look at the way. This, but that the way I work that scene out is also my writer's voice. Because those are the ideas that come to my head. Someone else might have looked at it differently. Somebody, I mean, do it right now. You know, Think about the scene and say to yourself, all right. But you, the positions would be the same. But you go, one, they're both hungry. Uh, there's no bread at one house. Uh, and they want to go to the store and the other person has bread at their own house and they just want, they don't want to go to the store. So those are positions, right? Now work that scene out and however it plays out is how it plays out. You might even convince the other person to go to the store. Depends how you work the scene out. right? And of course, number four, you want to keep your voice. So, um, oh yeah, here's real quick, real quick. Boop, boop, ba -doop, boop. Oh, I'm in the way. So keep keep your voice, right? So you want to keep your voice uh, as you make changes. So be mindful of maintaining your unique uh, writing uh, style. You got it. You know, it's important. Uh, but going going back to this just real quick. As you can see, I work through uh, the feedback per feedback. I was saying if it's, uh, you know, if it's subjective or subjective. And you might end up getting more feedback than this. And that's okay, too, right? But uh, with all that said, I'm going to give an extra nugget of knowledge, okay? And, uh, you know, th things you should keep in mind is uh, when evaluating uh, a feedback, consider each piece of feedback and decide if addressing it would improve your novel. Um, basically, in the example I used, all the feedback was pretty valid except for a couple things uh that i would sort of like do last right uh but i assure you that it is not always going to be that way you are going to get a mixture of feedback that may or may not be important more importantly you want to prioritize your changes so you know the most common issues are the things you should really put a lot of effort into uh you know these issues will affect the overall reading experience that's just what's going to happen you know uh you know when you're done with that reading you know eh, that writing you know that means uh, you're almost there right so uh i would make a plan personally and by making a plan uh what i would do is i'd create a revised uh plan focusing on the prioritized issues for example i would plan to cut unnecessary details in the middle chapters for this example revise the main character's actions in chapter 10 for this example and expand the ending to resolve conflict and set us uh, satisfactory uh, uh experience for the reader um but you also want to address plot and character inconsistencies even though they weren't that big of a deal you know you can still focus on the main character decisions just read through them are they making consistent decisions you know you may be seeing that but one reader not seeing it if the other readers are seeing it, I would almost go back to the other readers that didn't comment on it and say, uh, what what would you say is that character's motivations or what would you say? Define that character for me. Right. So instead of giving them a way to, to answer if it is consistent or inconsistent, ask questions to. Uh, ground the character. So if they start telling you things that pay off chapter 10. Um, without you leading them to yes or no based on the original claim that they were inconsistent, then you'll see that the foundation is there for the character and that probably no work is needed. All right. But if they come back and they go, well, that character, uh, I don't know, they like uh, uh, they like pizza. And you're like, oh, but they, they chose... They chose Greek food, though, in chapter 10. 
but they were supposed to choose pizza, you know, <laughs> whatever the case, you know, anyway. All right, questions. What's the most uh, challenging piece of feedback you've ever received? Uh, how did it improve your writing? Let us know in the comments below. Uh, as always, if you found this video helpful, please uh, share, like, and comment, uh, and, and subscribe. You know, hit the bell icon if uh, so you don't miss out. Um, final thoughts. So remember that beta reader feedback is crucial, is a crucial component of the writing process. It offers external perspectives that you, as the author, deeply embedded in your creative process might miss. Now, these fresh eyes from the beta readers can uncover hidden flaws and highlight strengths, providing a more objective view of your manuscript. While it's essential to consider beta reader feedback seriously, balance it carefully with your own artistic vision. Feedback is a tool, not a rule. Feedback is a tool, not a rule, okay? Um, it should inform and guide your revisions, not control them. You are the architect of your narrative. Use feedback to enhance the structure of uh, that you've already built, not to allow it to dismantle it. So I'll repeat that. You are the architect of your narrative. Use feedback to enhance the structure you've already built, not dismantle it. Pay particular attention to common issues highlighted by multiple readers. That's a very important insight into the manuscript itself. The more readers that point something out, the more you should look into it. These are not just isolated comments, but likely indicate a broader resonance or dissonance with your audience. Addressing these, can, these issues can significantly improve the overall quality and reception of your book. So approach the feedback with the intention of refining your work. This isn't about rewriting your entire manuscript, but polishing and tightening areas that could be improved. Remember, this is the fourth draft, not the first draft or even the second draft. All right. This is all about little moments or expanding on something. You could add a chapter. You could take a chapter away. That's still fine but you do not have to rewrite your entire manuscript because each piece of feedback is an opportunity to make your narrative stronger, more coherent and compelling, not to incite you to throw it all out and start over because then the process starts over. So as you sift through and implement feedback, ensure that your unique voice remains intact. Your voice is what sets your writing apart and resonates with your readers. Let feedback enhance your voice, not overshadow it. Understand that writing is, and uh, it's a process, you know, it's a uh, it's process of uh, here's first step, second step, third step, you know, you got to do something and you got to do a little bit more work to it and go back to it. The revising, this is why all great writing is rewriting. All great writers have great editors, right? Uh, and sometimes the characters make you do it. Anyway, understand that writing, is, uh, you know, even though it's, it has a process to it, you want to look at each draft and how it brings you closer to the best version of your work. The fourth draft is a significant step in this process, leveraging external feedback to refine and enhance your storytelling. I just want you to keep in mind that, uh, you know, you got to be willing to experiment, even with suggestions from beta readers. Sometimes they might lead you to a, a greater discovery of your own internal story. But not all advice will work for your story, and that's okay. The goal is to keep learning and evolving as a writer. I'm going to say that again. Not all advice will work for your story, and that's okay. Next video in the series. The next uh, steps to writing a novel, your fifth draft, which is all about line editing and proofreading. I'll be honest with you. That's the last step. After that, it goes on to more business stuff. No more creativity. It's all after after that fifth draft. That's where it all gets to the end. Anyway. All right. So, as always, peace and harmony, truth and action, and uh, keep developing the right mindset. I'll see you next time. Love you. Bye.